So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome for this uh, second webinar of the series of three webinars on uh, promoting private sector engagement in SD activities. So as you know, my name is Rafael, project coordinator for the UN SCAP on supporting the South-South and Triangular Collaboration Program on STI for Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. So now to give the opening remarks, uh, we introduce uh, Mr. Jonathan Wong, Chief of Innovation, Enterprise, and Investment of the United Nations SCAP. So Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much, Raphael. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, so let me just by saying, kind of start with a, a warm welcome to you all to this webinar on engaging the private sector for human capital development in Cambodia, Laos, PDR, Thailand, and Vietnam. Um, I, I will be brief as, as we have much more interesting people than me speaking today, um, who you will hear from. So, so I'll keep this brief. But, but just to provide some background, this webinar is organized as part of our initiative on South-South and Triangular Cooperation on Science, Technology and Innovation, or, or STI, among Cambodia, Laos, PDR, Thailand and Vietnam. We'll, we'll go shorthand CLTV for now. Uh, and the, the objective of this webinar today is really to enhance private sector engagement and share knowledge on how we do that in STI within the CLTV countries. And it's really been designed to bolster the capacity of both policymakers and other stakeholders to craft and implement policies that effectively stimulate private sector engagement in STI human capital development. Um, a key focus of our initiative, of course, on South-South cooperation um, on this project has been collaboration, particularly between CLTV countries, as, as collaboration, as we all know, is a key driver for innovation. And, and, and with this in mind, collaboration is also the theme of, of this webinar. And we'll be adding a kind of an additional layer of collaboration into this, but by really focusing on how the private sector can collaborate with government and academia to capital, um, catalyze innovation. Uh, and, and two of the core themes of the webinar today will be corporate engagement and building human resources, capacity and talent mobility. So, so why these two themes? I, th I think first on, on corporate engagement, uh, as we all know, the private sector has been and is still now uh, uh, the engine of innovation and, and plays a critical role in developing the human capacities we need both for innovation both now and indeed will be in the future as well. And, and second on talent mobility, just maybe a personal story, I, I myself have worked on innovation in the public sector, in the private sector and in academia and I found it really really helpful um, for a few reasons. I, I think firstly kind of just knowing firsthand kind of how these different sectors operate, you know, the different perspectives they have on innovation and, and really appreciating the differences, but also the aligned objectives that these sectors have. I think it's been, from, from my career, has been a really useful exercise in, in, in thinking about productive and, and, and hopefully harmonious collaboration, which, which it always is between, between different sectors um, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, as mentioned, I found this really useful and we'd like to explore this a bit more today as well. Um, in addition, and, and just in closing, I just, again, really want to thank you all again for joining us today. I want to say a special thank you to our speakers who have taken their time out of their very busy schedule to share their expertise, insights and experiences with us here today. We really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And last but not least, a huge thanks to the SCAP organising team and indeed ACWA for moderating the session as well and for bringing this all together here for us today. So, so that just leads me to say, um, again, I, I hope you all find this session today useful and insightful. And, and I really look forward to hearing the outcomes of the session today. Thank you, Raphael. I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Jonathan. And now to introduce our moderator, who's going to be guide our conversation today, uh, Dr. Apiwaj. So Apiwaj, over to you. If you'd like to introduce uh, more of the, the presentation, the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Raphael. Um, so, um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Apiwat uh, from Chalonkorn University. I am um, acting as the uh, the consultant to this project. Um, we've been working quite a bit with um, different stakeholders in the four countries, and I'm very excited today uh, to be your moderator um, of the uh, of the of the panel discussion. Let me first introduce um, our panelists today. Um, firstly, we have um, Dr. Siang Heng Hao, the Under Secretary of State um, at the Ministry of Industry, Science, Technology, and Innovation in Cambodia, uh, with his dual experience as a former professor and currently a policymaker in STI. Um, Dr. Hao uh, will 
uh, tell us uh, about um, some comprehensive perspective on the uh, academic and policymaking aspects of STI. So welcome, uh, Dr. Hao. Uh, joining us next is um, Dr. Warajit Zetapan uh, from the expert group ASEAN Talent Mobility for Thailand. Her background is in academia and her role in the Thailand's funding agency, uh, PMUB. Uh, it's, uh, this experience has equipped her with a unique viewpoint on STI policies and talent mobility. So thank you very much for your participation today. Um, we are also very delighted to have um, Dr. Jenny Lynn Amako, the regional coordinator at um, Eurocess Worldwide. Her exp expertise in human capital development uh, in Europe provides valuable insights into the talent mobility experiences in the European context. Um, uh, unfortunately, she um, has uh, some flight delay, uh, but she has already uh, responded to, um, to our questions. So we have her recordings uh, to, um, uh, uh, to show uh, later today. Um, our fourth um, uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Poon Sak uh, Ko Sia Pon, uh, Assistant to the President at the Directorate for Man Manpower Strategy in Higher Education, Science, Research, and Innovation, or NEXPO, um, uh, the agency from Thailand. He's with us today. His specialization is in uh, talent mobility, and I hope uh, we can hear from him how um, different uh, governments, especially Thai governments, had, uh, have offered um, ways to encourage the private, private sector investment in STI capabilities. Um, we are also honored to have uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, Al Shazli, uh, Director of Sponsored Programs and International Relations at Heliopolis University of Sustainable Development and Sekhem uh, from Egypt. Uh, he will uh, bring a novel perspective from a private university in um, Egypt, uh, focusing on holistic policymaking and Sekhem's engagement uh, in building STI capabilities uh, through the university. Last but not least, um, Dr. Panuwat uh, Trangkanuwat, uh, who's the Managing Director of the Corporate Human Resource Division as SCG HR Solutions uh, Company Limited from Thailand. Uh, his experience with the leading Thai corporation uh, in building STI capabilities offers insight into the needs of large corporations from government support in the region's um, STI development. So welcome uh, the six, uh, six speakers uh, and panelists that we have today. So um, without further ado, I would like to start first uh, with Dr. Hal. Um, you are uh, at the moment a very high level uh, policy maker in, in Cambodia, um, but you've already uh, had a lot of experience uh, working in, in the academia as well. Um, so. I would like to ask you um, the first question. Um, what are the primary challenges related to engage, engaging the private sector, uh, including uh, both uh, domestic and multinational companies in Cambodia uh, for the development of STI human capital in Cambodia? Um, Dr. Hal, please. Thank, uh, thank very much, uh, Dr. MP Watts, and thanks for the organization of this important seminar on something which is touching my heart, you know. I love development of human capital and I always uh, convince stakeholder that without proper or without strategic development of uh, human capital of talents, we cannot go far. And I think uh, it's 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 a very nice question that you discuss the challenges uh, to engage private sector. If I think this question it stay with me since I was a university uh, teach a university researcher ten years ago. We talk this and now we talk that, but of course it's uh, persistent always. I think uh, we cannot. We uh, please bear in mind that we cannot uh, find a solution. The contact from one to another is always different. Also, so the current uh, challenges that I would uh, share is, uh, I think one is lack of incentive scheme, meaning private sector might hesitate, especially in developing nation. You know, private sector are hesitating to invest 
in uh, resource in human resource developments and O&D all of these are are the challenge so I think most of model uh, those uh, developing emerging economy they are relying on you know start first from government on that and second is uh, unfavorable regulatory uh, framework or climates which restrict or you know uh, it, it's normal we 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 face that most of developed nation of course these are quite favorable but most of uh, least developing country or developing country trapping in this uh, you know structural structural framework allowing uh, technology allowing knowledge allowing skill you know to be mobilized uh, challenging i think the the number 3 is uh, education poor education quality we we uh, we we have to bear in mind and keep in mind that you know quality of education is is always the foundation of everything. And this always the challenge is especially for emerging economy. Number four is lack of STI human resources. You know, overall education, of course, but how many percent on STEM? How many percent on the right sector of STEM? Because when you say STEM is too broad also, which uh, sector of STEM, which sub-sector of STEM that you, that we, prioritize or we see that it is important and it is innovation. Innovation means it serves the development of private sector, it serves uh, social economic development as all. Number five is lack of net networking. I think it's always uh, a silo, you know, but even though in a developing or developing or least developing even developed nation, this remain uh, essential to fight the bottleneck of working in silo. I think uh, UN escape uh, working. I work with UN escape. UN escape provide this recommendation to how to mobilize the I also is to breaking the silo. Everybody like to work in their own room and <laughs> do not like to collaborate with others. So fight for this is important. Number six is limited infrastructure and resource, especially for OND. I think uh, infrastructure is uh, remains uh, essential because if you want to uh, improve uh, talents, if you want to improve uh, human resource, how much knowledge you create in health, how much how much uh, technology in educational technology for education technology are we invested uh, to to have in a particular nation? These are remain challenges. Also, I think numbers. Uh, servant is lack of awareness of importance of STI for economy. I think even I myself uh, am not in a high level of a political decision, but of course, starting as a researcher in university and now working in the polit political level in the government, we always see that people say that, oh, economic is important. Let, let move the economy. How can we move economic without the foundation of human resource in STI, the importance of technology in, in, in enterprise, all of this, uh, it, we, we talk a lot on the, on, on the surface of economic itself, but the bottom, you know, the foundation depend inside the economic development is STI. You see most of developed nations in the world, what they are doing, they are not selling rice, they are not selling uh, vegetable, mm. fish, or all of that. And last one is IP law. You know, when when we, we we want to engage with private sector, you know, they, they are very mindful first on how uh, to have a proper mechanism or law legal framework ensuring that technology, knowledge are created by private sector are well protected. So enforcement of IP law, ensuring the mechanism that is favorable is, is something that remains challenging. Uh, that would be the eight point that I would like to raise about challenges for mm -hmm. for engaging private sector. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, Dr. Hal, I have a quick question. So I really find it interesting that you mentioned networking. How do you engage the private sector in Cambodia from, from your perspective? I mean, you work in the academia, you work for the private sector. Now you are at a senior level of policymaking. 
How do you see the government engage in building networking with uh, the private sector, uh, at least in Cambodia? At least in Cambodia, you know, we what we have been doing so far, you know, in, in general, uh, the question is, is stay with me since 10 years, 20 years back in the university. We always, triple helix model, UILO, all of that, we always discuss. You know, the principle of, uh, of how to engage private sector is to stay as close as possible together, academia, private sector, and and uh, policy makers. The things what we have been doing so far, you know, especially in our, our TO or in our mandate, we try to create sufficient legal framework. Now from government side, we are doing, uh, we, we are creating, you know, in the next, in, in a few years, in the past few years, we, we are doing our best to have a, a sufficient legal framework, ensuring that private sector are, uh, are having confidence in investing on SCI. Did this are from government side that I that I, I can say. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. I mean that's great because um in our conversation earlier this week about uh, startups, uh, we heard a lot as well from both the private sector and from um, policymakers about this this trust. Uh, you know the confidence and trust between different actors uh, in the. Um, in, the, in this ecosystem of STI and how the trust and the confidence will lead to um, the proximity, you know, that, that you say closeness between different actors. So thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your answer. Um, so let's um, next move um, uh, uh, to um, Dr. Panuat, who's actually from the private sector uh, himself. Um, and, you know, with your experience uh, in SCG, um, you know, one of the largest uh, companies in Thailand. It's very innovative. So we're, we are very glad to be able to have you here today and hear uh, your perspective. Um, in the conversation that our team had with you earlier, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, about um, the, the direction and the approach of SEG uh, when um, designing the overall policy of SEG, um, you mentioned the term high value added of innovation policy. And so uh, could you first explain to us uh, what, what you mean by this um, HVAC, um, the high value added innovation policy, and, and how SCG has implemented this uh, concept concerning the development of human resources at uh, SCG. Uh, Dr. Panuat, please. Thanks, thanks a lot. So I think uh, for private sector or for like a company like, like us, I think we should start uh, firstly from, as a company, we, we need to like, uh, make the profits, right? So that we can sustain our, ourselves, we can survive. So based on that, uh, uh, it did it back many years ago in SCG, I, I would like to tell some story. So uh, at that time, we are so good at uh, like running a, a good plan. We we are strong to be like cost leader. So uh, we can produce any product, but with the cheapest cost, that's that what we are good at. Uh, and then we are strong in the domestic market. So we know we have a lot of channel and leash uh, every province in Thailand. Then uh, a lot of number one and number two world player in uh, various industry, if they want to uh, come to Thailand to uh, penetrate Thailand market, uh, they want they would like to join venture with us. Then we have a lot of joint venture at that time. Uh, many many companies uh, happen, and uh, we diversify a lot of business in the city. And one day we think that, what if, what if those uh, number one number two world player they go back to their country? How can SCG survive? Then we think that we should have some innovation or some technology that we develop on our own. So that that's the starting point. Uh, and that we call it like high value added products and services. So then from that time, uh, we uh, we run our business like a cost leader for many, many years, like 50, 60 years. Uh, we develop our employee in that way. And one day you ask people to be in no way it will be like difficult, right? Because people in the plan, they like you they wait for your order, right? Uh, turn left, turn right, 
push the button something like that because uh, it's a high uh, high investment plan right and one day you let them like please raise your hand uh, please uh, show your idea please tell us some creative something like that so it's hard to be that then we need to start to do something uh, okay along the time even today we we always invest in uh, employee development we develop the functional capability along the time but I think it's the mindset. Uh, even people like two people have the same capability, but one people mindset is like just keep maintain the status quo, right? But another one would like to have like innovating innovation, uh, have the my mindset of like inventor. So it's different uh, when they implement or when they deliver things. That that time then we start to to uh, develop people in that way. So. Uh, how how be how to become like have a researcher mindset and at that time uh, SEC we 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 have just few researcher so we start to recruit like PhD researcher first uh like fifty people hundred people like, to have like critical mass uh, so that they will walk around they work around and they uh, lift up our uh, general employee to to have those mindset and then we start to implement like the environment the culture or the ecosystem. So we have something we call like, inno people. Like you should be like risk taking, you should be like assertive. Uh, you should be thinking of the box kind of that. And we start to roll out those ideas, training, uh, uh, encouraging people, uh, and also invest in something like hard side, like facility. We start to invest more like lab, uh, like tools, uh, research thing for those facilities. Then people uh, start to to feel the way to go to be HVA. And uh, we talk about like, please in no kind of like, please in no, please be in no innovative kind of that. Till like one year's part, it's become the like, top of the town. In every meeting, people start to talk, please be more in no, more in no kind of that. Uh, and people start to think it that way. So every corner of the CGA thing, they start to to think their own product, to think uh, think in the innovative way. Even the back office, uh, they also mm. they can deliver the innovative process, like accounting department. Mm. They can like uh, shorten the time uh, with the supplier, with the ven uh, vendor, with the customer. So both the front and back, they all start to innovate. And that that uh, one thing, uh, not just the the uh, employee or the uh, executor. Uh, the boss as well, right? The leader. We need to innovate them as well, right? Lead need to develop them uh, to the way that they will not be, they won't be like roadblock to the employees. Okay. Mm. Just, you know, people uh, in SCG, we promote from within. So like me, I work here about 30 years now. So oh, I wow. kind of, I know a lot. <laughs> when my subordinate <laughs> comes to me, sometimes I know even his problem or her problem, like, right? No, I can tell you what your problem. I can tell you answer. Kind of that. Yeah. Uh, we start to 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 train people that please stop, please please uh, slow to respond to your employee to your subordinate. Let them speak mm. first. Let them talk first, mm. and let them think on that one. But you should be like facilitated mm. leadership. Mm, I you, see. I yeah. see. And you should be. I like, have a quick, quick... Thank you. I have a quick question though. I'm and you you've been with SCG for 30 years. Um developing this innovative culture and mindset, how long did it take for SCG? Oh. I'm not sure. 20 when, years, but I think 10 two, years. I think at least four to five years, but but it's just one day oh, that we okay. we feel that oh it now like routine, like new routine. It is now. Uh, that's actually quite impressive. I was thinking of you know 10, 15 years, but if if five years, then it um you you are giving us uh some hope, right? That um you know five years is not a long time. The fact that you can change or adjust the mindset of you know people in the accounting you know department to to the leadership uh, within five years, I think that's that's a really great example. I have a few questions, but we'll come back to my questions later on. Thanks. Let's move on to the third um, panelist. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Dr. Warajit. Uh, um, so, Dr. Warajit, you yourself, you know, um, as a, a professor, 
uh, you have uh, done a lot of research, but at the same time, you are also engaged in uh, research funding uh, with PMUB. So I'm I the question that I I like to ask you is um, basically how universities can better prepare their researchers to meet both academic standards as well as the practical practical needs of the businesses, because now, uh, you know, with PMUB, uh, you're not just preparing, uh, you know, researchers to become, uh, you know, somebody in the ivory tower, you, you, you'd like them to be able to respond to the needs of the industry as well. If, if you could tell us a little bit about how, how you think uh, uh, governments can do this, please. All right. So thank you so much um, for your question. Um, I, I wear many hats. OK, so at first I was a university lecturer, um, researcher, and then I moved um, to uh, PMUB to help out in the funding system. So I'm I'm like looking on the perspective of both sides, both as a researcher and both as the um, more of a government funding agency. So as far as I see is that um, the university need to prepare um, the their, both their lecturers and also their researchers um, for the future. And the future, it has to be demand-based. And we need to um, not be in the ivory tower. Our research has to have somebody to use, even though um, it's basic or frontier research. So um, basically, the universities, um, lecturers, researcher have to step out of their comfort zone uh, and meet with the private sectors. And then... Um, what I feel is that um, sometimes it's because like we usually like study all the time and we do theories and, and do research, but not real practical work. So there are a lot of programs to help the um, university's researcher to come out like the mobility program um, to the uh the private sectors to see the real issues and using the research to help solve uh, the real problem. Not only like the, the large private um, pri companies, private sectors, many universities have the program for um, to help SMEs and everything. So those kind of research, um, it's, it's do or die. You can't stay in your university anymore. If you don't come out, you won't get any funding. You won't get any um, uh, research result and so on and so forth. So, so everyone have to be adaptive and, and move toward that. Another thing that I see is that the university, um, like a lot of professors, they have a difficult time uh, communicating, um, not only with the private sectors and also with the communities and the general public, communicating the importance of their work and how it can help. To, to the public. So um, with the, the different language, I say, even though they speak Thai <laughs> or English, but it's just still like a different um, language in communications, like science communication. Um, so, so that's might be an, another way of how to, to communicate um, understandably and how we might work with each other. So not being too intimidating um, to the others, because I, I see a lot of time when I talk to the private sectors or the local community, they, they kind of got intimidated because we're so academic. So we have to come to have to come to to the same type of understanding. It's not too academic. We're talking the same thing, but just different language. So another thing I want to say is that is to just create awareness to when communicating and how we can work with each other, and also um, uh, reaching out to the private sectors or the community to have the research to practical need. Um, there need to be to build a trust between the partnership and the stakeholder. That trust doesn't, um, it's not just project by project. It's not pro one project and we leave. It's not, the trust is long-term. So the, the university researcher have to figure out what is their career path. And the career path is toward what industry and you need to build that trust as long-term and consistent. And that will help um, to help solve the issues, also raise the, the career for the researchers as well and as well as benefit the private sectors like that. So, so that's um, um, what, what I feel out of it. I, I'd like to ask you that those are really interesting um, uh, issues, right? The, first about the communication and the language and then the trust part. I would like to combine them a little bit because sometimes, you know, uh, when we don't understand each other, it's so difficult to 
build trust, right? And and what you're saying, absolutely right. It seems like, you know, the, the corporate, the private sector has their own uh, culture and the lingos and the languages, as well as, you know, the government uh, have their own culture and the languages. And in order to put, to put them together and build the ecosystem and human resources, you need the common language as well as the, uh, the, you know, eventually the trust. How do you see the role of PMUB as a funding agency in building the language that people would be able to understand, you know, about uh, one another, as well as eventually the trust from there? What's what's the role of PMUB there? Okay, so the role of PMUB, um, we we kind of move toward, even though we fund frontier research, so frontier is basically like basic science um, in new emerging market like that. So the, the user, um, sometimes it's hard to see what is the future industry is going to be. So what, what we do is um, we use funding as a mechanism, meaning that if you want funding, you need to do First, you had to build a team, <laughs> team as a consortium, not just you yourself in one university. You have to build like various universities and you have to have industry partner or government partner in the proposal to be submitted. So only one institution submission, um, you won't get any funding. So that's the incentive or, or the regulations that we set up. So that have to talk to each other. So the second um, way is that we feel that PMUB is an intermediary, meaning that we bring together stakeholders to create dialogues. So you might see that um, in PMUB, we hold a lot of workshops, a lot of meetings to bring people together and talk as um, uh, PMUB will be like intermediary in there to figure out the needs for each uh, one, the universities has their their um, expertise in in this area, that area, private sector need here, they have industry. So we try to um, make that or form it into a bigger project. And then mm -hmm. not only that, like we bring partners or other funding agencies together. So what one thing that I realized is that um, so there has to be a, a, a middle person intermediary who can mm, communicate mm. and understand um, different language. So PMUB have the mechanism called agile team, meaning that we have like um, academic partner who are very well versed in talking with the, mm, um, uh, mm. the private sector and also well versed talking to the academic as well. So they're the middle person to, to kind of like analyze and figure out what mm. is the common ground. So that's the beginning. And then we try to merge the have like the two side talk to each other. So it's it's a long process and it's hard to find yeah. that person to be able to do it all. Yeah. So that's Thank one. one that is, yeah, that, re really cool because uh, now we see that, you know, the role of a funding agency is not just to give out money. Money is almost secondary there. The the ultimate, uh, you know, the actually the proximate and the ultimate objective of giving out, out money is to first building the networks, the partnerships, create dialogue, eventually the trust. So thank you very much. We'll come back to, to this point again in the second round um, when we talk about talent mobility program. Um, let me ask Dr. Poon Sak uh, from Nexpo. I mean, Nexpo is a, you know, is a policymaking agency in Thailand uh, when it comes to STI and education, uh, higher education. Um, Dr. Poon Sak, uh, what, what do you think are the role of, um, you know, uh, governments can do in giving the incentives uh, to companies uh, to invest in, in STI human resources? So my, my question is quite specific there. Uh, you know, it's 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 about um, incentives that government can give uh, to um, to the private sector to build STI. Do you do you have any examples in Thailand or beyond that uh, you can share with us, uh, please, Dr. Punsa? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Apiwat, uh, for the introduction and question. Uh, first of all, if if we take a look at the past uh, ten years, we can see that uh, we have uh, a lot of incentive to uh, providing. Uh, or helping the private sector to uh, develop the human resource. But for the recent uh, uh, needs for the advanced technology or even for the innovation, uh, uh, as we heard from the SCG, you can see that a lot of the companies uh, uh, really want to you know, improve their culture and acquire some talent coming to the companies. Therefore, the uh, past year, we create a new uh, incentive for the 
private sector we call the stem uh, stem plus uh, incentive uh, what we do is about uh, when uh, the private sector would like to hire uh, the stem professional uh, they can get the benefit of 150% uh, tax deduction for for hiring that uh, those staff and another one is for the uh, when they want to train the have a workforce in terms of STI or uh, in the STEM, uh, STEM. Uh, for example, the digital transformation or the uh, industrial 4.0 or whatever that related to the STEM, they can get the tech benefits at 250%. This is the, the, example, the real example that we have currently. And uh, a lot of things is very, uh, very, very important incentive for the uh, ecosystem development, like uh, Dr. Walajit mentioned. Uh, uh, ecosystem is uh, very really, uh, important for starting the innovation. Of course, the government understand that, and therefore we have some uh, uh, program that uh, uh, helping the private sector to do something like a co-creation program uh, to support the private sector in the uh, like a training modules and uh, early recruitment uh, processes for the for uh, between the university and uh, the private sector to get the talent into the uh, to, 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 uh, the good environment for the innovation. Another one is the consortium development uh, process is uh, uh, is very uh, important as well for the uh, uh, coll helping the collaboration the, between the university and private sector. So uh, the government help the consortium like uh, doing the skill survey and doing doing some something like a uh, uh, academy uh, forums to support the private sector or uh, even for the engaging the co research between the university and the private sector and a lot of things coming for the uh, uh, regulation not just only the incentive for the tax or the the, uh, the funding another one is coming from the uh, regulation relaxation like the education sandbox that uh, is uh, allowing the uh, uh, university uh, come uh, join together with the private sector, develop a new kind of the uh, human resource development together. We have some example like five university working at one uh, uh, study program to support uh, the private sector. And even sometimes we have um, more than that, uh, but uh, uh, we can see that uh, not, not a lot of the people uh, it's very hard to, to start at the beginning, but uh, anyway, the incentive like this one or the uh, deregulation uh, like a sandbox would help the private sector and the university working together more easily. And the, I, uh, from our experience, we can see that uh, the intermediary like Dr. Wolajit mentioned is really uh, most uh, important for you know, engaging between the private sector and university. Therefore, uh, for the past 10 years, we try to help the university having like a one-stop service or the tailing house, that having the staff there to uh, uh, traveling around uh, or contact the uh, private sector and try to get the research problem from the uh, uh, private side and then come back to search for the talent from the university side. And later on, they help each other to carry uh, to writing the proposal and get the uh, research funding for like PMUB, like this one. And other thing else is like a, 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 the incentive for the professor. For example, recently, that's the beginning of this year that we, we uh, successfully the, uh, developed the new kind of the professorship we call the innovation professorship. Uh, basically, um, uh, from the uh, we can see that we, when we want to get the professorship, uh, basically we, we uh, write the paper, research paper, and do something like other kind of stuff. But uh, innovation professorship is a, a, a little bit different. So if they have the professor can help uh, the private sector or doing some research together and get the higher impact, like a startup, a spin off, and those impact would uh, be com coming back for the benefit of the professor or the faculty in the career as well. See this, uh, the mm -hmm. summary, the, the brief about the incentive for the government side. Thank you very much. I, I really like um, uh, what you mentioned about this uh, professorship 
uh, of innovation. It seems like uh, it's like in the medical school or law school or in business school where they have professors of the practice, you know, people who have experience working in, in practice, not just in the private sector, but elsewhere to come back and teach uh, courses and work with the, with the students. Uh, it's, it's actually a really uh, great idea to explore even more. Um, you also stress the importance of intermediaries. Um, in addition to what Dr. Warajit uh, mentioned earlier, uh, in a webinar early this uh, this week um, about startups, everybody was stressing the importance of intermediaries, not just you know funding agencies like PMU, PMUBs, and others, but also um, startup associations and things like that. So it, it would be great uh, to hear more uh, a little later uh, about um, about the the role of intermediaries there. Let's um, let me ask um, our fourth panelist, uh, actually fifth panelist, um, Dr. I met um, uh, from uh, the Helios uh, uh, Heliopolis University of Sustainable Development in in Egypt. I, I have to share with um, the uh, the other panelists and and um, and uh, the participants in in this webinar a little bit about uh, the background um, before uh, I ask the question uh, because um, uh, you know and 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 thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ahmed for um, you know joining us from Egypt and uh, for a short notice. I happen uh, to be sitting next to the chairman of the board of the university just a couple of weeks ago. And then we realized that um, you know, there's a lot of things that we can learn uh, across continents, really. And Heliopolis uh, University of Sustainable Development is, is really fascinating. If if any of, of you are interested, uh, you can contact uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ahmed directly or go on to the website. Now, um, so um, uh, Dr. Ahmed, um, you know, it, it, uh, your university is really interesting because it's a private university dedicated uh, to sustainable development. And, and it started from SECHEM, uh, which is a, now a social enterprise, but it started from, you know, agro-industrial uh, companies. It's now one of the, you know, prominent, most prominent agro-industrial groups of companies in, in Egypt and the Middle East. Um, so could you tell us a little bit how SECHEM as a private company, now social enterprise, engage in building uh, human uh, resources and STI in Egypt and beyond, uh, particularly um, uh, the, the, the example of Heliopolis University of Sustainable Development? Dr. Ahmed, please. Uh, Dr. Apiwat, <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation and for giving me this chance to be with uh, with you in this uh, South South cooperation, which is very important. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Sakem uh, Sakem uh, started as uh, the first uh, initiative for sustainable development in the Middle East uh, when Dr. Ibrahim Abulaish, the founder of uh, Sakem, came from Europe in 1977 back to Egypt to try to start a new community, to build a new community, a uh, new sustainable community. And uh, yes, he started with uh, the idea of organic and biodynamic agriculture because he believed that this is the solution for many, many, many uh, uh, things in, 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 in Egypt, um, problems I mean. Uh, and uh, he believed that he cannot do that without investing, without building uh, the capacity of the people. Uh, good ideas are not enough. So he he invested a lot in building the 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 the, uh, the community. I mean the holistic approach of sustainable development, which based on four pillars: the social one, the economic one, the ecological, and environmental, and the cultural one. And um, um, in uh, two thousand and five. Um, uh, after after establishing a series of companies in in medical uh, field in uh, in agriculture of course and in uh, uh, and for instance for the textiles and more he believed that he needs or we need in Sikkim um, a, a science and innovation lab in order to uh, have new ideas in order to develop some models and prototypes to be upscaled and mainstream within the Egyptian community. And uh, 2005, 
uh, we started with uh, the uh, Heliopolis Academy for Science and Technology. And after that, in 2012, uh, we moved to Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development. Now, Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development, after almost 11 years, we have around 3,000 students, five faculties, engineering, ag organic agriculture, business and economics, physical therapy, and pharmacy, where <clears throat> uh, we are trying to embed the concept of innovation, creativity, uh, within the the, the the students from different disciplines. For instance, all the students, they are studying a course um, entitled Innovation and Creativity. With, uh, regardless of their, their, their major, they study it, and uh, this is very important for them. As well as investing in the human capital, we have ESD program, Education for Sustainable Development for academic staff. Uh, we have a training academy for the administrative staff. And on the top of that, in 2017, uh, in 2017 we um, developed second vision goals, which are consistent uh, and coherent to the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And uh, in order to achieve that, we have developed six research and community service centers at the university. One of, uh, one of the most important centers we have is uh, the Entrepreneurship Center for Social Impact where we are incubating and uh, we are hosting uh, green startups from our students, from the community, from uh, the, uh, the local community and from outside. And uh, we managed uh, to graduate around 200 startups, green startups within the last three years. And we are taking them from the early beginning, from the early idea to the incubation phase, to access to market, access to finance. And we are giving them all the technical support and sometimes the financial support in order to, uh, to execute their ideas. Moreover, we are um, relying at Heliopolis University now on the partnerships and uh, building consortium and applying and getting fund from different um, um, funding agencies to support our research and innovation which I will speak maybe in the second round more on, on, on that. But uh, I mean, um, we are managing now around 32 projects funded from different uh, funds from EU, from the uh, uh, GIZ, from the USA, from other uh, funding agencies in order to embed again and in order to foster the innovation uh, science and technology and science and technology in in, in Egypt. I, I don't want to exceed my time, but maybe we have a second round to elaborate more on that. Ashley, I, I have a quick question. Um, yes. So, how how is the relationship between Heliopolis University and Sekhem as the sort of mother company? Because the, the the reason why um, your uh, story is so fascinating is because in Thailand we have uh, the, for example, a, the PTT Group, which is a you know gas, gasoline, and, and energy company, uh, one one of the largest companies in Thailand, uh, built a very uh, sort of uh, you know a university targeted primarily on frontier science. But it seems like in the case of Sekhem and uh, Heliopolis University, it's a little bit more related to the commercialization and uh, product development part, right? Not 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 at the level of like super science, scientific um, sort of deep science level, or am I misunderstanding that part? No, no, you are totally right. Our companies at Sekem, which are more than 20 companies working in pharmaceuticals, organic products and textiles and more, they are, it is a win-win situation between the university and the, the companies. We are uh, helping uh, the companies uh, in the research and development, we have established um, a program, very interesting program, Transdisciplinary Experience-Based Learning Fellowship, where we, the students and the staff, they are doing the research in order to serve the needs of the companies. The companies mm. provided the, the, their weak point, their needs, and the students and the staff working on it. And I, 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 I want to... Uh, um, uh, explain this more in the second round, but at the same time, um, a companies are very, very good venue for the students for their learning trip. Because for instance, uh, we have a program called community-based 
learning where each student, uh, each semester, spend around two weeks away from the classes, away from the, from the classroom, away from mm. the university, mm. uh, having his own or her own experience from working in the companies, having internship in the company, uh, going to the rural areas and uh, explore uh, what mm. is the problem of the community. And mm. then when he or she came back, trying to elaborate on that with the academic a supervisor mm. so i think the, 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 there is a close relation between the uh, second mm. holding and uh, heliopolis university fascinating fascinating well we'll come back to other uh, other um you know uh, uh, details in the second round now um uh let's move to our last uh, panelist uh, uh, jenny uh unfortunately cannot uh, join us live but she recorded um, her answer to my question. Um, I basically asked her uh, to provide insights uh, into the EU's uh, Erasmus Plus program, uh, which is basically a program that aims to support capacity building for um, higher education. And I asked her how this kind of program could help the development of SDI capabilities in the CLTV and perhaps the ASEAN region. Uh, so here is uh, Jenny's uh, response. Thank you very much, Dennis Kat and Brian, uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. For the... I had hoped I would join you live, but uh, this is where we are. So, on the first question, uh, the EU's Erasmus Plus program, particularly its focus on capacity for higher education, plays a pivotal role in enhancing educational quality and fostering international collaboration, especially in regions like. Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and uh, here are some reasons. So, first of all, in promoting internationalization of quality in higher education, Erasmus Plus uh, facilitates partnerships between European universities and institutions in the CLTV region. And uh, these collaborations often lead to the exchange of best practices, uh, innovative teaching methods, and also the development of joint curricula. And these uh, international exposure certainly helps local institutions to align global standards. The other reason for that uh, is that the program supports, uh, there is a focus on, of the program on building research capacities as well in various scientific fields. And this is certainly beneficial for the CLTV region where there is a growing need for advanced research infrastructure and expertise in science, technology, and mm -hmm. innovation. Of course, I uh, would like to foster regional cooperation, and uh, the program encourages this regional collaboration in higher education and uh, promoting a shared approach to tackling common ch challenges as well. And an uh, example of this would be sustainability, public health, digitalization, technological advancement. The other thing, of course, would be the provision of funding and resources. Erasmus Plus is a huge program. There are a lot of actions uh, that are you know, entry points in collaboration between the EU and the COTV region. And uh, the program offers significant financial support for projects uh, that aim to improve the quality of higher education and build capacity in research and innovation. So, of course, this would definitely help as the CLTV feature you know, grows. So, the focus on quality education, international collaboration, and skills development of Erasmus Plus is definitely a partnership that would be beneficial for CLTV, but we also eager to see that the CLTV region can contribute as well to is collaboration between the and other regions. Okay, great. Um, so you, you can probably um, hear that um, there's opportunity for um, the CLTV uh, agencies, uh, agencies in C CLTV uh, region to um, utilize the Erasmus Plus program of the EU uh, for capacity building uh, for higher education in the region. So this is one uh, possible uh, um, 
uh, option uh, for us to explore uh, in terms of funding and in terms of collaboration. Now, let us turn to the second round uh, of um, our panel discussion today. Uh, we <clears throat> discussed in general how uh, the private sector could be incentivized and promoted to engage in uh, uh, capacity and, and human resources development uh, building in in uh, in STI. Um, we have a more specific uh, issue uh, we like to focus on uh, in the in the in the second or in the, the second round. Uh, it's it's called talent mobility. So the idea behind talent mobility, um, you know, it started a while ago. But uh, when we had the conversation with Dr. Hal when uh, uh, for the first phase of this of this program. Um, Dr. Hal mentioned that, uh, you know, this is a critical issue and, you know, in Thailand as well, um, talent mobility uh, between the private sector and the, and, and the academia and the, and the, and the research institutes uh, was not uh, well uh, promoted. So there have been some attempts and uh, uh, policy measures to, to promote and to support talent mobility uh, among uh, the different um, agencies and, and sectors uh, in, in the region. Now, let me first ask Dr. Uh, Poon Sak um, regarding talent uh, mobility program, because uh, Dr. Poon Sak, yourself, um, you are um, the person who's been working on uh, this issue for quite a while. Uh, if you could um, uh, tell us a little bit about Thailand's ta talent mobility program, um, you know, the ongoing activities, uh, what challenges you uh, you, you have, and uh, what would what are the future prospects for talent mobility program for Thailand? Please, Dr. Punsa. Thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, I will uh, give a bit about the uh, the beginning of the talent mobility a little bit. Uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, we used to uh, have the police uh, initiative called talent mobility uh, uh, in the Ministry of Science and Tech. That's a long time ago, uh, nine years ago. And uh, later on, uh, four years ago, we just start uh, uh, having the reform. Uh, so the Ministry of Science take uh, combined with the higher education institutions together in the new ministry called Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation. And therefore, at the first phase, the, we, we uh, worked uh, we did the proposal to uh, to propose to the cabinet uh, to get a resolution for allowing the the professor of uh, the faculty the, to work in the private sector uh, legally uh, as the same way as the as working inside the university. Uh, that's the first thing that we done at the first year, and uh, after that we uh, initiate some uh, uh, policy to like uh, establish the caring house about 20 to 30 universities coming together and try to find out uh, how to establish those the uh, caring house inside university like, uh, like a entry point to uh, like uh, intermediately working uh, with, uh, between the private sector and university. Uh, another one is try to help the university uh, to formulate the uh, uh, inside internal the uh, regulation as well because uh, if if we have the uh, private resolution alone, we cannot, you know, uh, allow the professor to work in the private sector, uh, 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 basically. Therefore, some of the university uh, start to uh, uh, rise the uh, regulation uh, for allowing that uh, professor to work on the outside university. Another one is we create some uh, financial support. So the at the beginning phase, we have the uh, the budget to subsidize to the university the department that lost losing the the professor working outside the university. The compensation come back to the department so they can hire some other people like a, a workload to other uh, faculty or even hire a new professor. That's a, that's the incentive that we create at the beginning phase. So after we have some reform, then. Uh, uh, the policy of it like NSVO, we moved uh, toward to the uh, the new uh, policy of it to the new ministry. Therefore, we stopped uh, doing some uh, the telemorality program as uh, the policy program, but we uh, transfer that program to the uh, permanent secretary uh, office 
And therefore, today, uh, the Ministry of Higher Education still working on the talent mobility in in different way uh, after the first phase. But uh, it's a very uh, continuing between the, the first phase and second phase. Therefore, I myself, I'm work, also working as a committee for the permanent secretary office in this uh, manner. And the good news about uh, today, uh, uh, talent mobility is the we have PMUB and PMUB are coming together in this uh, forum as well. Therefore, we uh, we have we announced the ASEAN Talent Mobility uh, this year. Actually, we try to start the ASEAN Talent Mobility uh, since uh, we have some meeting at Nebido a long time ago. But uh, after the reform, it's more easier for us to you know work on this this uh, project. And if we look forward for the future, uh. Today we can see before looking at the future, we can uh, uh, come back to see uh, what we have done and what we have to improve uh, from the current situation, like a, a ecosystem, research ecosystem between the university and private sector. We can see that more than thousands of people have already uh, had the experience about the uh, formulating the research problem from the private sector. Uh, it's very good news that we have some group of university they join together and give the new position to build up you know, increase more uh, faculty number of uh, and to gain the experience in the private sector side from 3% to 15% in the uh, next 10 years something like that that's very really good news for the university and some of them just uh, uh, move toward to something like uh, helping the university holding company uh, in in the startup company under the holding companies. And so therefore we have a lot of startup in the research ecosystem in the private sector in in, in uh, like a, the startup ecosystem. Um, therefore, uh, if we take a look at uh, take a look at the future, uh, we believe that uh, this is uh, this pro uh, talent mobility program is a really handy tool for the government. Uh, to help the university professor and the private sector work close more closely and in terms of the research and innovation. And we believe that more and more people, like we have done in the past 20 years, that uh, we successfully increased the number of the university teaching professor into the uh, research uh, professor from uh, 5 to 10. Uh, now we have like 30% of the university that uh, concentrate in the, in the research uh, research uh, academia, and therefore we mm. believe that in the future we we going to have more university professor having uh, a broader experience about the private sector uh, research. I believe that mm. uh, for the next ten or twenty years we can would have like a thirty or forty percent of the university that have the wow. relationship with the private sector. So, uh, not only the research, but uh, it would be like a, a, a manpower development or even something like, a, you mm. know, the, the tailor-made uh, from the university uh, mm. student and continue to, like uh, Dr. Wallachit mentioned about the trust at the beginning, that would be about the student mm. or human resource mm. development. And later on, they can keep uh, the uh, more and more uh, co collaboration in the research uh, uh, stuff. And therefore, in the future, we believe that international co collaboration would extend more the uh, research ecosystem because not only mm -hmm. inside one country could uh, supply like uh, infrastructure, research problem, or even more the grand challenge that we have like, today. Uh, therefore, uh, we look forward mm -hmm. to, to expand the collaboration for the international uh, in order to exchange the people or the talent to gain more experience mm. in the uh, in the global uh, manner. That's that's a brief mm, about the, very much. the situation. Yeah, mm. uh, thank you very much, Dr. Punsa, because you actually just asked um, Dr. Warajit uh, uh, on, <laughs> on my behalf, because uh, Dr. Warajit is actually taking care of the, uh, you know, overseeing the ASEAN level, uh, you know, at the regional level, international level of the talent mobility program. Um, Dr. Warriji, please, if you could tell us a, lo a little bit about the um, talent mobility programs at the ASEAN level. Uh, what, what are the activities, what are the opportunities and, and the challenges that uh, you're facing uh, as part of this program? Please. 
Okay, um, thank you very much. So uh, for, for me right now, another hat is also the expert group on, on talent mobility um, for ASEAN. So um, it's for Thailand, which is um, me and then um, Dr. Sompong, which is the director of PMUB. So we are we're, are officially dedicated um, to help also support ASEAN talent mobility. As well as right now, um, the ASEAN Talent Mobility Community, the program is a flagship program, which is the priority for 2024 um, for COSTI endorse. Um, ASEAN COSTI is Committee on Science and Technology and Innovation from, from ASEAN. They endorse as the program to be the priority in 2024. So there are a lot of momentum trying to get um, ASEAN to come together going toward that. So um, as in talent mobility, I'll call ATM, right? Okay, um, ATM is not dispensing money, but trying to dispense talent, okay, to, to the demand, um, which means that we, we set up a more of a structure that we have five units or five houses in the ATM community is the mobility coordination unit, which involves the um, ATM expert group, um, which is uh, appointed. It's a more of a high level appointment from each country. So now we have a member who helps support and drive this program together and be the one who coordinate with the national level program. So that's the, the first one. The second one is talent pool. We want to um, accumulate um, the ASEAN talent to see what kind of talent are out there and we can analyze what is needed and what is a supply in um, in the needed which sector like that. So we, we have a platform, like a kind of a database starting off right now. And we're trying to figure out ways to, to have a membership and also support that, that talent pool. So people will know how to access talent within ASEAN. And then ASEAN um, also um, the Academy, which is ATM Academy. Uh, which is want to have that capacity building program and to help with the mobilize between also um, researcher um, in academic area, uh, as well as mobilize within the industrial sector. So we're trying to figure that out. How might that be? What is the needed? And then um, also the research house, it's the fourth unit to try to figure out ASEAN grand challenges and using form of ASEAN research team to do that. And we, we have support support by the dialogue partner or have to figure out the form and mechanism to, to get the funding for the researchers as well. As the fourth one is the guest house, which is we open to all our, of our dialogue partners to, to work with ASEAN together to help support and nurture the talent. So I, I, I talk a lot, but it's a five unit. Now it's more of a structural base and figure out how to go together. And so when, when we have the meetings and a lot of dialogues, we notice that in each country ourselves, we have so much resources and talent out there. Each nations have their own programs, capacity. But when we um, present to each other, there's a lot of similarities for all of us. So if we bind together just the national programs, like the postdoctoral program or young researcher program from the Philippines and fellows, Indonesia have their own program. So if we kind of combine together, it's like we, we have a lot of resources and funding there to help nurture our talent. And then if we have that um, topic to work together as ASEAN and to mobilize with each other, and that would be fine within, within that mechanism system. And the dialogue partner are so willing to also help support us in, in, in the industry or, um, or the topic that we need. However, the main challenge is how to figure out the real gap or what is the initial start in what um, uh, private sector topic should we need to build the talent on. We might talk starting about the green talent due to the climate change and everything. It's a hot issue, hot topic, but what type of um, green talent it's also uh, that we have to figure out. And um, not only the mobility program, we have to look at the regulatory program, uh, regulatory issues as well, because mobilized between countries, there are like visas issue and various things that we have to work out in the form of ASEAN. So that's a lot of the challenges going on on, on that one. But um, the ATM group that we're trying to mobilize is 
trying to leverage from our national program and made some initiative as an ASEAN level, which one can become an ASEAN level and create that communications to provide opportunity for others to, to help mm. um, to, to be a part of. Because usually mm. there's, we talk about a lot about ASEAN program, like um, AUN, ASEAN University Network, Simeo Raidet have also have mobility program, but, but sometimes mm. it's like um, the, it's, what do you call like bilateral or or yeah. uh, university to universities and it's not being right, right. As, as enough so this is a regional I, level yeah so how how can we raise that into a regional level to reach a more higher aspect um either promoting mm. top down or bottoms up it depends so now mm. now we're trying to set up a mechanism for top down um top down is good because if we do top down um the, the policymaker, big bosses with budget, they would know. And then if we create um, a lot of um, publicity and see the impact that it can it create both for each country or ASEAN and also promote economy in the private sector as well. And then with that, mm -hmm. we can get more traction and attention into there. So um, at the end, when there are so much opportunity, we have so much resources and yes. talent. Just need to match the talent to the the demand, yeah. And then mm -hmm. um, so one of other yeah, another challenge is reaching out to the private sector in ASEAN as well, and that's right, one of right. the issues. yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, thank, thank you so much because it feels like you know this is a very good but at the same time very ambitious program, right? Because you're not you're you're elevating uh, uh, you know the, this uh, intermediary role of uh, some sort of, in, you know, like um, funding agency or some task group at the national level to deal with issues at the regional level. And at the same time, you have to, uh, uh, you know, engage the private sector at the same time. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to hearing more about um, this ASEAN level talent mobility program that you're in engaged in. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have a little more time later to discuss this. I have a few questions noted down. So, but um, before um, that, uh, I, I I like to ask Dr. Ahmed uh, from uh, from Heli Heliopolis University. Um, the the question I'd like to ask you is is based on what you um, discussed earlier in the first round, as well as um, you know our um, our uh, understanding about your work a little bit. Um, you yourself, uh, you know, was a uh, professor uh, at uh, Alexandria University before, which is uh, a really well-known uh, public university in Egypt. And now you moved on to, um, you know, Heliopolis University of Sustainable Development, which is a private university, right? And then we heard, we've we heard from other uh, panelists uh, about the importance of cultures, the difference between institutions and how to integrate them so that, you know, uh, the private sector and the public sector and the academia can work well together. From your experience, Dr. Ahmed, uh, you know, you worked for the public sector, now in the private sector. What, um, what's, what's really the, the, you know, the differences uh, between uh, the private sector and the uh, public sector when it comes to, um, you know, uh, universities and how these two different types of universities engage the private the private sector differently. What are the the key differences uh, between them and and perhaps different outcomes uh, between you know these two groups of the universities? Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Apiwat. It, it is a really a very important question, and I will focus my answer on the research and innovation and the technology transfer, uh, because this is uh, this is uh, the the topic of our discussion today. Um, you know, uh, Alexander University, for instance, and the public universities in Egypt, they are very big, very well known, a uh, lot of uh, um, uh, international names in, in terms of researchers and more. But my, I, I'll be very honest on that. The problem is um, you as a, a researcher or academic staff want to get promoted from, for instance, from assistant uh, a professor to associate professor or to a full professor, you have to do some research. And the guidelines of the promotion um, in the uh, public universities, this is the, the constraint from my point of view. I have done a lot of research. I have published a lot, a lot of research. And the good research I have done and the good papers I have published, I didn't 
delivered them, uh, uh, presented them for my promotion because they are not eligible. <clears throat> this is the problem. They are, uh, for instance, you start, uh, I started uh, as uh, uh, in the field of marine science, marine geology, and then, you know, in your trip, in your journey, you change a little bit. So and now I'm, I'm focusing on my research on the climate change issues and the, the, uh, the uh, sustainable development research and all. So I cannot get promoted with those research. So this is one of the most important uh, um, obstacles. And I found this not only in Egypt, to be honest, but also in Europe. I don't know the case in Asia, but in Europe as well, they, they, they are suffering from these guidelines or these uh, uh, complexities in the promotion. The second thing that the interaction with the private sector and with the industry. Here I would like to uh, uh, f f highlight that for, for instance, uh, the public university, they are not engaged in the, in, in the private in, uh, sector problems or the, the needs unless they have been asked to do so on the personal uh, communication, but not on an institutional basis. Uh, uh, in, in the case for, for Heliopolis University, for instance, no, Yani, this is our idea, this is, this is our concept and vision to link between the academia and the, uh, the, uh, the, the industry and the, the community, because we believe that yani, the scientific research, the, the main mandate of the scientific research is to solve and to give a practical solution for the, uh, the uh, uh, industry. So for instance, we have, I would like to highlight two important programs we have. The first one is Abu Laish Award. Abu Laish Award giving fund for the uh, students and for the um, teaching assistants and demonstrators uh, for their PhD and their master programs. Uh, and they have to develop a product. They, they have to have the end of the, 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 the research is to have a product, something tangible. Uh, and the, the second program is transdisciplinary experience-based learning fellowship. The goals of this is a pretty new uh, program, <clears throat> less than one year. Uh, and the, the goals of this program is to, to drive interdisciplinary research. Uh, here we, we, we focus on having interdisciplinary between different disciplines, co-creation of innovative solutions. The solution should be applicable and uh, scalable, impactful and profitable. Uh, this is the, the, this, the story. And it should address industry need or pain points. And this will guarantee the exchange of or the transfer of knowledge and technology between the academia and the private sector. For instance, we started with some of uh, SACAM companies and we will scale it up uh, next year to be uh, for all companies in Egypt. Uh, and we started, for instance, with EZIS. EZIS is uh, one of the companies of SACAM for uh, herbs and for herbal teas. And we uh, asked them for their uh, uh, important, three, the three important uh, uh, problems. For instance, they said that they have problem in extending the shelf life of the products, uh, spoiled products and disposal of the wastes, and uh, the post-harvest quality monitoring. And then we engaged students from the Faculty of Organic Agriculture, Faculty of uh, Business and Economics, and as well Faculty of Engineering. With the, the, the students were amazing. They developed solutions for uh, the uh, for, uh, solution for th that serves circular economy, the composting, uh, and how to extend the life uh, time of the uh, the shelf life of uh, the products. We extended that as well to the Nature Text, our textile company, and students from the Faculty of Pharmacy and Faculty of Organic Agriculture. They uh, they and they have some solutions for the bioactive textiles, or they call it smart textiles. So this is very, very, very interesting. And uh, we support them financially. And, and this is the research. The now students with their academic supervisors, advisors, they are publishing. They are publishing this. And we, uh, uh, in order to support, because, you know, not all the, the, the research, and it is not required, by the way, to be published in the highly ranked journals, Q1 journals, Q uh, in Scobus and Web of Science. So we helped them and we uh, established a, a journal, a, a Heliopolis University journal for sustainable development and where we host and absorb 
the publications of the students. I think uh, in this direction, we are supporting the research and innovation and um, I think this is innovative solution. And this is one of the main differences between the private universities and public mm. universities. Thank you so much. I mean, it's 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 really wonderful to hear um, the direct experience from you, because um, you know, in in our region in Southeast Asia, even though we have talked a lot about the role of universities, we tend to focus more on the public universities, and we are actually have we we do have a lot of private universities in the region as well. So it would be really fascinating to learn, uh, you know, uh, from Egypt and perhaps. Uh, from from one another, how we can engage uh, private university such as the Heliopolis University of Sustainable Development uh, e even more, and because we 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 really hear that um, the proximity between the mother or the holding company and the university is so close that it facilitates uh, the flow of knowledge and and the human resources very well. Thank you very much for sharing that. We'll we'll come back uh, with uh, you know a few other questions later on. Let's move on to um, uh, Dr. Panuwat, uh, who's really from the private sector. Uh, now we we like to hear from you. You know from from your company's perspective. Um, is there an existing talent mobility program uh, at SCG, perhaps with other uh, universities in Thailand or beyond? If, if there isn't at the moment, what types of programs or, or activities do you believe that um, you know, uh, would be beneficial for the company to implement? Um, so my question, I guess, is twofold. Do you have a talent mobility program at the moment now at SCG? If not, uh, what else uh, you like uh, you would like to have, Dr. Panuwat, please. Yeah, thanks, Kim. So, uh, if we talk like more higher level on the public sector, private sector, and academia, I think, uh, what what I heard so far, I think uh, the if we want to incentivize like private sector, uh, to do more on STI, I think the the first thing maybe, uh, you need to do something to convince those uh company in the private sector to have one KPI about R&D spending or uh, R&D things in their enterprise KPI. I think that's the first one. Because like, uh, once SCG have that one in our enterprise KPI, then we go in this way. Before that, we never thought, think or like, talk about this thing. So I think this is the first one. And uh, once those companies turn to see this, turn their face to look at this point that you want them to look at the STI, the research thing, then come with the like profit so revenue and cost right so first about revenue how they can uh, increase revenue uh, uh on the research way so they they have demand like like uh, uh dr what you said like so and i think the atm is a good project and i understand that atm is kind of you handle the the supply side so you you have collect all supply side uh, among asian countries uh if the ATM can do something on the demand side. I'm not sure, but if you can do that, uh, let's say in the private sector, there are like uh, SML, right? Large and medium and small. For large demand, uh, it's clear, it's a big chunk. So I think uh, you understand it, it easy. But for medium and small, uh, it may be like scatter or like tiny or too small uh, pieces. So you need to like, collect them so that it's come into chunk and you can handle uh, those demand like a form big company. And then if you can like arrange uh, activity or activity for them, that demand can be supply. Uh, uh, they can like exchange, they can exchange the, the problem or the need, right? And they will have people from public sector or academia to help them. I think that's a, a good opportunity for private sector because we don't know who and where <laughs> that we want to find those superman, those super women, right? Uh, uh, if if you align those opportunity and maybe one mm -hmm. view thing, uh, if you align like how how this research project or technology can apply to wireless industry, that one thing. But on the opposite, uh, for this specific industry, how can uh many research or wireless technology apply to this specific industry? So I think uh, mm. that more understand from private sector because they only known from their own uh, own thought own viewpoint uh, that can mm. make them like uh, understand easier to to match 
do some of really to to meet the the demand uh, the supply side i think and mm -hmm. also, as well as the talent mobility i, I think the same thing uh, yes we do have uh, talent mobility program exchange uh, researcher SCG with i think nxpo we 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 uh, had had do before and other institution or like uh, in uh, in the same uh, like private sector uh, together yes we have uh, so this thing like if we have if we can matching demand and supply, then private sector uh, they can increase their revenue. And I think they they would like to to see they wait for those conference meeting opportunity kind of that. Yeah, like like they align the job seeker day. <laughs> so we mm -hmm. have a mm position -hmm. and those like new grad mid career mm -hmm. they come to the event kind of like like that like job market. But this may be like research market. And then the 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 last one is on the cost side. So uh. Uh, increase mm -hmm. revenue and also reduce the cost. And private sector, we we yes, we would like to invest everything, uh, facility, hard side tools lab, uh, to to complete the whole thing so that we can innovate, right? Uh, then if the public sector or uh, uh, a public sector like government can help us, right? Like, let's say I heard that there are like three hundred uh, percent claim on actual expense for private sector in the R and D thing. That very good. Or in the academia, I'm not sure. Like for those professor or those researcher under academia, uh, they need to do the things that the university or academia uh, need them to contribute. But if mm. if the thing the the contribution that they contribute to the private sector can be count as the score as a performance score in the university world in the academic world, I think those professor they would like to contribute to private sector as well. So I think uh, mm. these things together kind of uh, relax the rules and regulation, or even more like set up the rules and regulation to encourage uh, public and academia to to support private sector uh, as much as possible. Uh, I think that will will uh, support the private sector and help them. And uh, I think the way that private sector believe that research uh, research project is the light at the end of tunnel to them. Even they uh, clearly mm -hmm. make profit or make loss, uh, if they go mm -hmm. in this part, it's the it's the best answer for them and sustain. So so I think uh yeah, start from like incentivize them, uh, let them turn their face to mm -hmm. this view. Mm -hmm. Consider that mm -hmm. ID spending is one crucial enterprise KPI, like like mm -hmm. leading like world leading company, right? And then uh, mm -hmm. help them increase the revenue, reduce the cost. I think this is uh, mm -hmm. be the, the the holistic. Approach to the private sector on STI thing. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I really, I really appreciate your um, comment about KPI. A lot of times, you know, um, we we tend to think about some abstract policy objectives, but uh, in in practice, in terms of operation, especially for HR, you do need that KPI, and you need to institute a set of KPIs so that the companies can actually achieve or you know, set them as, as the target. I think it's also on the side of the supply as well, uh, you know, um, on the university and the funding agency side as well. Those KPIs are important. So thank you very much uh, for, uh, for, for that uh, comment. Now, um, we actually asked a, a similar question to Jenny. Um, about um, how uh, Eurosets uh, has been involved in uh, talent mobility program uh, in uh, CLTV and ASEAN region. So we have a, a short recording uh, from Jenny uh, regarding uh, their activities of the EU. Please. So you work first in the European Commission initiative. I'm currently the regional coordinator for this initiative that supports research and mobility and theory development. And it has indeed uh, been actively involved in uh, talent mobility programs with ASEAN. Just uh, some some weeks ago, two weeks ago, I was in Bangkok uh, and we had the EU ASEAN dialogue in uh, talent mobility. And uh, you know, these efforts often align with the uh, broader objectives of the EU ASEAN talent mobility dialogue first. And one of the key initiatives where your access has been role is through the promotion and adaptation of the European Charter for Researchers. Of course, localizing this in the context of, uh, of ASEAN. So this charter sets out rights and responsibilities for researchers, 
we are also employers and funders and it aims to ensure attractive research careers and improve employment for people as for researchers. So we're talking here of research collaborators and we the support for inspiring CM how to do the same to define the climate, whether they want to have it win there, whether they want to have link to it, sustainability and uh, also whether they want a charger as well. But the most important thing here is it's really on not only the policy dialogue, but the best practices exchange and for both these richer rights and working conditions. So the first side is with us as well. And we were together. She was actually called for moderating that session. And uh, we are hoping for more collaborations in uh, brain circulation and talent. Signals. Great. So we hear that um, there is a funding opportunity and there's uh, additional forum at the regional level uh, to, uh, to pursue this um, regional level talent mobility uh, initiatives. Now, um, I would like to ask Dr. Hal, our last uh, panelist of the session, now that you have listened to all these wonderful, um, you know, uh, exchanges and, and, and sharing from our other panelists uh, from Thailand at the ASEAN uh, level, from Egypt, um, in your opinion, what opportunities and challenges might arise when uh, trying to implement talent mobility programs uh, specifically within Cambodia? Uh, Dr. Hao. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Dr. Pivot. I think the challenge uh, in Cambodia, if this regional platform are, guide, are the guiding document as well as supporting for, uh, from dialogue partners and university perspective, I think the challenges in Cambodia, what I can say is what are the regulatory framework that we take because the government has to solve this. Uh, what are the regulatory legal framework uh, to be in place, ensuring that, let's say, the talent is uh, locally mobilized and ensuring that the talents are moving legally and happily cross border. I think these are the uh, legal framework that immediately from government side must be in place. And if we talk about the triple helix model, uh, the the matchmaking uh, from academy also, let's say we want a particular researcher or scientist or skill labor for instance to be mobilized from one country to another. We have to have the capability to, to do that also. And another one is from uh, private sectors. Are ah, private sector uh, ready uh, to be in the platform or not? Because, you know, uh, private sectors uh, must see this as uh, see this is a, a opportunity, but private sector see the profit also and competition. I think must be there also. I think in principle, it's like that. I think it's not only in Cambodia. So these are my view on on the challenges that may arise uh, once uh, the initiative at ASEAN levels, at uh, dialogue partner level to support this. Uh, for your information, thank you. I, I have a quick question, um, Dr. Hal. Uh, would, would you see the differences between um, large domestic companies versus multinational companies if you like to try to implement um, talent mobility programs in Cambodia? Domestic, international, what, does it matter? I think uh, it should not be a matter as long as, uh, you know, we match up the right uh, private sector in. But uh, what uh, private sector, you know, I, I recently discussed with private sector also about this issue and they, they need a strong support from government also. And government, like what again, I said again, it's uh, how government are ready in terms of legal framework to support. Let's say uh, a talent uh, is mobilized from one place to another place. Uh, what are the uh, uh, law 
or regulatory framework ensuring this is uh, this is uh, incentivized this is uh, legal this is uh, unknown you know uh, mutual benefit uh, from 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 both sides and, and private sector immediately mm -hmm. asked me uh, uh, what are uh, what are the government intervention ensuring a trust between uh, these mm -hmm. two Mm -hmm. uh, private sector yes. thank, thank you. you all right yeah thank you very much dr hal um so we've finished two rounds of discussion um already um there are a few keywords um that i i really would like uh to um to use actually as part of our uh, uh development of the workbook uh for for this project one is certainly uh, what um, uh, most of, of the panelists have mentioned, which is really the trust uh, between, uh, you know, the public sector, the academia, uh, as well as the private sector. Uh, without that trust and confidence uh, among one another, uh, it would be very difficult uh, to form uh, some good partnerships uh, to build uh, something, you know, uh, uh, you know, to build the capability and human resources in the STI. Another one that um, I heard a lot is is also uh, the issues of deregulation and reforming, adjusting the legal and institutional framework uh, that would allow uh, for uh, flexibility uh, for the talent and the knowledge to move uh, more freely. Uh, in in one country and across different sectors, as well as at the regional level, um, another one is a, it's and the, the important roles of intermediaries uh, and intermediaries are not just um, uh, you know uh, funding agencies like PMUB, but also uh, industry associations and other associations of the private sector at all levels uh, to work as the uh, catalyst um, and to bind and and create bond uh, among different actors that that have been operating uh, in silos before. So these are uh, uh, you know at least the the three uh, key points that I I um I got out of this conversation. Uh, it also reminds me of the um, the conversation we had uh, early uh, earlier this week on on Tuesday um, about startups. And uh, one of the speakers uh, back then was talking about how we should change the mindset uh, when we build the ecosystem uh, in uh, of STI in our region. Uh, he said we should move beyond uh, this sense of competition um, only, uh, you know, cutthroat competition, uh, pulling one resource from the other uh, because we have limited resources. So we should uh, shift uh, from uh, pure competition to more partnerships. Even though we still compete, uh, we should find ways to partner uh, with one another so that we can build the ecosystem together. Um, so we have about 10 minutes um, left uh, for open discussion. Um, I would like to open the floor, um, you know, both to the panelists, but also the participants. If you have any questions, uh, please either raise your hand uh, or if you're not comfortable uh, to speak, you can write down your questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, please, uh, let's um, you know, let's open the discussion. Uh, anybody else um, would like to ask questions to the panelists, perhaps? Uh, Dr. Ampevat, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have discussed a lot on talent mobility and yes, uh, Yes, the representative from European Union hardly answer, of course. But can you or our panelists here share what are the experiences in Europe on talent mobility? I think would be an insight uh, for you know, in like uh, some some thought for us also if uh, we get some idea mm. on this. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I mean that that's a that's a great question because. Um, you know, uh, the European Union, I mean, they have, you know, much bigger union, uh, right? So uh, there's quite a lot of flows between the human resources in different sectors already. Um, Dr. Warajit, do you have any insights on how the European Union is done it? Um, yeah, uh, in the um, ATM workshop, we have a lot of um, best practice sharing from the EU as well. They have a really... Um, 
What I say, they have a very good platform and program to support all level of researcher, from young researcher to senior researcher. And then in the mobility, um, not only they have a supporting system and to help like if the researcher mobilized between country to country, they have that nurturing system as well. Um, when when they arrive to the other country, and uh, and also European Union have um, a career path program for the researcher. When you mobilize, what kind of career path it happens? So um, the lesson learned that that we have from them is that the whole ecosystem to support brain circulation have been set up for, over the past like twenty years, not just just to mobilize, but it's like uh, preparing for jobs, preparing for the regulations. When when they discuss with us um, for the ATM charter, to um, because they have the EU charter for the researcher. It's everything is all been set and it's like kind of regulated. There's like um, law and regulation on there, but um, it's harder for uh, ASEAN to do it because we don't have one government. Government, <laughs> we have like ten plus government. So so that is one of one one of the reason. Um, another one that that I can share is that it's um, like what PMUB is doing under the European Research Council program. Um, the ERC um, program where we send our researcher over to the um, ERC funded uh, principal in, um, investigators, the PI, where our researcher can go and be embedded with their research and to, to learn about how um, EU fund is being run. Um, the project is being run as well, as well as to make that kind of connection. And then um, with that, the ERC program is extended to, uh, well, for ASEAN is Singapore, the second one is Thailand and Japan and the US, so many for us to be sending over. Um, what I see is mainly for us going there, but the one coming inbound to our countries is not so much if we can develop in that area. Um, that 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 would be great for inbound as well to be completely mobilized. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that answer. I think one key point is is exactly that, right? Um, about the European Union has a government at the at the continental or regional level, while uh, ASEAN doesn't have. So we have to figure out uh, different mechanisms uh, to build this kind of uh, regional level initiative. Dr. Ahmed, uh, you have your hands up. Uh, yes, I would like to add uh, uh, to my co-panelists what, uh, what my co-panelists have mentioned regarding the EU. I, I would like to share <clears throat> that uh, the EU uh, is supporting the mobility and the talent mobility in the, for, for, uh, on the institutional level uh, and as well for the uh, individual level. For instance, uh, referring to the Erasmus Plus program uh, that have been mentioned by um, our co-panelists, um, they have uh, three key, key actions. The key action one is for in the, uh, uh, mobility of individuals. I mean, ongoing and uh, in, uh, in, incoming students uh, and staff from the universities, from the institutions, not only universities and outgoing uh, as well. There is a key action uh, three uh, in uh, this, uh, in this uh, Erasmus Plus supporting the, uh, the youth and the, the sports and the, the uh, NGOs, which is very uh, important and could be very beneficial as well. In addition to the big one, which is key action two, uh, which is supporting the capacity building in the field of higher education, but it is uh, on the institutional level. In addition, uh, there is a program um, uh, which is Marie Curie, where it, uh, it, uh, it gives opportunity to uh, the, uh, the excellent researchers to go to Europe to do their, uh, to, to implement their ideas and to uh, do their research in uh, the uh, elite uh, European uh, institutes. Uh, finally, the Horizon Europe program, which is very, very, very vast, which is supporting the excellence in research all over the world. And I think uh, a lot of opportunities there in this program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and those are really good information for us um, to um, use as benchmarks and you know maybe practices to consider. Um, any other questions uh, from the panelists or uh, participants uh, in the room, please? Uh, if you have anything, you can just raise your hand or um, uh, 
type down your question. As, as we wait uh, for people to ask questions, um, I, I have a personal uh, uh, sort of curious uh, question uh, about, um, about Egypt, actually, um, Dr. Ahmed. Um, you, you, you heard us, you know, in, in our ASEAN and CLTV region um, that uh, we were trying to work together at the regional level. Is there anything at the sort of regional level um, revolving around the Middle East or, you know, Egypt and neighboring countries that you could perhaps share with us? Uh, unfortunately, this is what I was uh, thinking about it. Uh, we at, at Sekam and Heliopolis University, we have, um, because I'm responsible for the international relations, I had an exercise last week counting the number of the organizations and the countries. And unfortunately, I didn't find a lot of uh, um, cooperation with uh, uh, our, I, I would not say Asia, because uh, the, we have a lot with Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Syria, and, you know, because we have mm -hmm. many programs in the Mediterranean. So they are they are participating. We are participating together um, uh, on the regional level, the Mediterranean, not uh, African mm. Asian partnership. We have um, 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 a running call uh, between supporting the uh, bilateral cooperation between Egypt and China, which is uh, um, yeah, uh, ten years ago. I mean, uh, started mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it is uh, working very well. But unfortunately, um, no, even Erasmus is supporting the partnership between Europe and Africa, mm. Europe and Asia, not between, not, mm. yeah, you, for instance, we cannot um, make a consortium of the universities or institutions between Europe, Asia, Africa, no, yeah, this is mm. the, the, the mm. problem. So, uh, yeah, you are right, yeah, and you, you think uh, in the right way, in my point of view, we need to have a mechanism for supporting this, uh, or at least as as far as I know, I don't I don't know, I don't know mm, if the, a, 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 I, a program or something, yeah, connecting this. Yeah, I I, I as as you know, it, it, we are uh, really fortunate to have you in the room today because then you know because the, our program is called South South Collaboration. I mean, South South for us at the moment is still limited to you know, our uh, Southeast Asian region, basically. But then, you know, uh, we can really learn a lot uh, from other uh, countries, developing countries, emerging economies in different parts of the world. And I really appreciate uh, the story of the uh, Sekhem and uh, Helio Heliopolis University there. Um, so we have a question um, uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, let me ask, um, uh, read the, the chat um, from uh, Patnerit. Um, when we talk about talent mobility, do you foresee the brain drain of the increase uh, and the increasing disparities in knowledge and expertise issue in the region? What are the win-win solutions? How to turn from brain drain to brain gain? I mean, that's a great, great question, right? Because when when talent can can move freely, they tend to move one way, right? <laughs> like for example. Um, I, I just happened to be in Italy at the moment, and you know, we are talking with a lot of universities in the U.S. They say uh, what happens a lot is that there's brain drain from you know the best people uh, move from developing countries to Europe and and to America, and they tend not to go back. So Patnerit's question is absolutely valid. I, I would like to ask Dr. Poon Sap actually, uh, you know, in terms of uh, mobility. I think the disparity, I think you can think of two ways. Um, one way is the brain drain from the public sector totally to the private sector. You know, we think of talent mobility as a sort of circular motion, right? What if the professor just quit the university? So that's one. The second uh, one would be at the regional level, what if the best researchers from Cambodia move to Vietnam, move to Thailand, and they don't go back to their home countries? Do you, do you see that happening? And what can we do? Dr. Punsa, please. Okay, it's a very challenge question. <laughs> anyway, uh, from the past uh, nine years, I, I don't, I didn't, I never seen uh, any professor that quit from university to the private sector at all, but instead, mm. uh, 
before actually before that before the, the talent mobility program we've seen some professor uh, uh, quit from university and work uh, in the private sector a big firm but anyway after for a while that that professor, former professor that's uh he's really uh really uh really uh, important person that who can uh, engage university uh, very well with the private sector for doing the research, mm. even the uh, uh, deeper uh, expanding the boundary between the research lab, uh, uh, research program from university to the private sector. And that's, that's one that I, I've seen. Another one is uh, uh, mobilizing between the developing country to another one. Uh, myself, I believe that uh, because of the uh, previous policy, we, we promote, try to promote the current professor, university professor to the private sector. So if we, uh, the professor, they have the very, in, in Asia, we have the uh, very long-term career. So basically mm. the professor not move to, uh, to the private sector or even to others a uh, lot, but just a few of them. Uh, but it's, it's very important that the first five years of the uh, professor Career is very important for developing the experience in terms of the you know the private sector or the leads. the challenge problem from the private sector is very important to the uh, professor career to to get success mm -hmm. in the final uh, you know at the end of the uh, career. We see in some mm -hmm. uh, environment is very uh, useful for the university professor to expand the, the network. I've seen the the FDI, the the foreign direct invest, investment uh, one company that they even open the forum, the academy of forum inside the 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 private sector is very very well in in place for the private sector to have the uh, the basic research uh, uh, from the university professor coming from different university camp and uh, focusing uh, talking discussing about the the uh, future challenge for the you know the deep technology for it not even uh, working on the current uh, technology inside the company at all but the company mm. they they told us that uh, the idea of of uh, from those professors that can you know help the the worker the uh, engineers to understand even more deep deep and deeper uh, understanding about taking the the the, the tackle the problems inside the company so th this mm. is the 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 very good uh, ecosystem for the uni university to learn more and more uh, but mm. it's uh, still limited i believe the, for the next 10 years we will, we will see uh, even more and more uh, ecosystem the better ecosystem like this and and, and another thing is uh, uh, not a uh, one country would have some only the limited resort. Uh, for example, in university, we have the limited resource for investing the you know high tech, uh, te uh, high technology uh, instrument and mm -hmm. tools mm -hmm. all the time. Therefore, it's very uh, a very a good benefit for the university or to, even for the uh, let's say Thailand, we can get the benefit mm -hmm. from the uh, uh, engagement with the mm -hmm. uh, uh, European country or even some other places that have have it. The very good ecosystem uh, than uh, our mm. current uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, in this way, mm. I believe that uh, uh, let's say that Vietnam, Cambodia, or even some other country that have been uh, the same uh, economic developing uh, situation, I believe that if we, we have some collaboration, we can do more you know, uh, the grand challenge pro project like uh, so sustainability mm -hmm. and commercial and like like uh, AI technology. Mm -hmm. Then when they come back to uh, their own country, they can have you know wider, uh, bigger perspective of the uh, uh, setting up the uh, research project or uh, research program mm -hmm. to the, the their own country. I think I believe this way we can develop the learning ecosystem like a lifelong learning in the global perspective. Uh, good good mm -hmm. for uh, everybody. Right? That's that's what Thank I think. Thank you. Yeah, no, actually, that's a really great, um, uh, 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 great perspective there because it feels like um, talent mobility programs are really not creating or leading to the brain drain. If anything, it helps keep the the brain uh, within within the you know the public sector uh, as well as in the country. All right, so we're running out of time. So I would like to ask our panelists to sort of uh, uh, wrap up and give your perspective. Um, one quick uh, last message uh, that uh, 
that you'd like to give to policymakers uh, in the region or anything? Uh, if if I if I may ask Dr. Poon Sak again, what's what's your one short uh, message uh, when it comes to uh, human resources development for STI? Dr. Poon Sak, please. Uh, for the short message, I will go to the. I I believe that the the uh, research or innovation ecosystem in uh in in different countries will have the different situation and therefore the uh in the future in the longer term anyone anyhow and anywhere that uh, people in this global uh, uh in in our world should have some idea about the you know other countries because the you know, the world the world is already connected and people mm. that already move around, like COVID-19, you can see that mm. it spread mm. very quickly. Sure. And the, the, in our mm. world, it's already, uh, already start connected. Therefore, we cannot think about only our own, you know, area of mm. a, uh, the, our own university or our own uh, ecosystem. Mm. But we think we need to think of the global uh, idea or even the global doing like a mm. global citizen. Therefore, if we try mm. to uh, help the university professor and the private sector in uh, uh, together, uh, we can uh, uh, develop the like a learning ecosystem in uh, uh, to go to the final stage of the development. Mm. Therefore, uh, thank you. If we think about the uh, BCG circular economy and sustainability, clean. Uh, innovation that would help the our global perspective and any any country will uh, I believe that would be a win-win situation like that. Thank you very much. Dr. Ahmed, please, um, any last message? The last message is uh, the, the my background photo, the circles of Sakem, which uh, which refers to that everything is connected public sector, private sector, industry, and academia. So this is uh, the way for the system to change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Warajit, please. Um, um, for, for my side, I'd like to promote an event to match the demand and the supply together. Um, that, that, that question was, was raised um, a minute ago from SPG. Um, so for the a, um, ASEAN Talent Mobility, we are going to have a big event called ASEAN Talent Mobility Connect on the 26th to 29th of February. And then we want to promote all like um, the various programs to come together um, regarding the supply. And we're also going to reach out to the demand. And so we're trying to have that figure out how to connect and meet because usually um it's a, we have a lot of meetings a lot of talks a lot of discussion but but what what is like really working um is mm. needed um it's um seems like we can't wait for a big funding from the government or changes in the regulations mm. because that mm. is uh, a much longer way but if we can mm. just match supply and demand using a national mm. program institutional program just to meet each other and start with that first and then I think the policy and um, several um, incentive will come once they see our challenges and um, our success as well so um, just mm. to promote we will send you information on ATM connect in February so see you then thank you thank you action speaks louder than words thank you very much Dr. Panuwat please yeah, so I think uh, as we know, like demand, supply, mechanism, uh, we'll solve everything, right? So it will maximize, minimize, and optimize all related factor. So I think if you can mm. like, enlarge it from ASEAN TM to like world TM, it will be really good. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. That's, that's very ambitious, but at the same time, <laughs> aspirational. Thank you very much. Dr. Hal, your last words, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Mpivat, and thank all panelists. I think it's it's a must to have a, a talent mobility a framework or mechanism, a favorable mechanism for regional level and local levels. The only word that I would like to emphasize is, you know, talents. We have to more to be more strategized in terms of what kind of skill, what kind of knowledge, what kind of training, what kind of talents that we have to, you know go into priority one, two, three, four, five, you know, cannot just say broadly, talent, talent. These are mm. uh, my message uh, shortly. Thank you. 
Thank you. Be more specific. All right. Thank you so much, um, all panelists and the participants. Um, I really appreciate all the uh, presentations, the, the comments, suggestions that you have. Uh, we will incorporate them in uh, the workbook that uh, our team are developing. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Rafael, please. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, everyone. I mean, at this point, I have a lot to say. I think I uh, appreciate so much the, the panelists here. It's such a very, was such a fruitful conversation. And just so you know, to finalize it, uh, we this is an ongoing process that is campus provides inside advisory service. So for some uh, government officials already reached out for a webinar, for a workshop we organized in December, and a few more webinars to come in January, potentially exploring innovation networks and this regional innovation networks. As we talk, this need for collaboration, so something we'd like to explore. But uh, for that, so thank you very much all for joining it. Please fill the feedback form in the chat. That's always useful for us. And in the meantime, thank you very much. And whatever, anything else, please feel free to reach out to us. And I'm happy to make this connection with everyone here in this room. And thank you all. And have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.